I've done that. All right, very good. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, now we're all set? Yeah. Okay, uh, I guess this is the first image that will be recorded, but that's fine. Uh, and it's kind of self-explanatory with the two wharves that are being pointed out by the kind of puce or pink colored arrows. Okay, let's move to the next image. I have to come into focus here. So here's all of Arcata Bay. You can see that's what they're calling it in this image. Um, and there are two lines drawn up the channel that leads towards Arcata Bay. And if those lines weren't there, you would see a bunch of numbers that show the depth of the channel. So there was a naturally occurring channel. It was here uh, when the whites first came in 1850 and set up uh, Eureka and Uniontown that later became Arcata. And they figured out pretty quickly that they could get ocean going ships up through this channel uh, into the Arcata Bay area, not all the way to uh, the shoreline, but as these lines show you within about a mile or a mile and a half of Arcata. And so the pink line is uh, the line that ships uh, wound up taking to go to the Arcata Wharf. And you can see where that line ends in the kind of upper right of the uh, image here uh, next to the Arcata Wharf. And then the green line below that went up the same channel uh, and it went to a slightly different location where the wharf from Bayside came. So this is a, a very helpful uh, situation uh, for people to encounter because they didn't have to dredge anything. They could rely on these natural channels. And there were also channels that uh, went down to the south part of the bay. Hmm. Now we have a fairly old uh, photo taken uh, from somewhere in Upper Arcata looking out onto the bay. And um, this actually shows both of the wharves being present. Uh, looking uh, up in the upper left corner, you can see the shingle wharf with the arrow pointing to that. Looks like kind of a straight line, although it actually is bent out in the bay. And then the Arcata wharf next to that. So both of these wharves were operational for a number of years uh, simultaneously, although the Arcata wharf uh, started first. And they both had uh, railroads running on them. And we'll look a little more at that. We're going to start with the Arcata Wharf, first of all. And we'll take you uh, on the route that was used uh, to transport things from that wharf. It was absolutely essential uh, to Arcata or Uniontown, as it was at first, to uh, have a transportation corridor that led from the bay to uh, the inland mines. And here we'll look at part of that route. Hopefully it'll come into focus. There we go. Uh, the red line that I've superimposed here on this 1911 map starts over on the lower left corner uh, in the bay. That's uh, where the wharf uh, existed and where they would unload supplies. And remember, Arcata started out basically as a supply port for the mines on the Klamath and uh, Salmon River. And uh, so what they had to do was unload the supplies there and by various methods uh, get the supplies to the inland mines. And uh, rather quickly, they put in the wharf uh, for the ships to uh, unload at and they started a small rail line on top of the wharf uh, that eventually went out a little ways past Blue Lake. Uh, before that was completed, they would actually have pack trains starting from Arcata. And uh, ultimately the route went as we see here uh, up towards the Mad River and then across the Mad River uh, to the second arrow at Blue Lake and then headed northeast. The third arrow, uh, which points to a sort of a dark line is where the pack train trail crossed Redwood Creek. And then the fourth arrow is up on the uh, Cooper Reservation. Uh, the map doesn't quite take it all the way to the center of the reservation, but that was uh, often the goal of these early pack train trips. And we can elaborate on that a little. Uh, here's another map that shows more of the detail. Once the Arcata and Mad River Railroad was completed, uh, eventually they had a, uh, a full scale rail line that went all the way to Corbell, east of Blue Lake, and they had uh, large locomotives that went most of that route. Uh, however, when they were transporting things on the wharf itself, they used a much smaller engine. 
But you can see from this map that they uh, went through the west side of Arcata. They actually went up to uh, where the little town of Alliance used to be and made a jog over to the um, east and went all the way up almost to the Mad River. You can see the high point of this line up near the top of uh, the screen. And then uh, followed the Mad River, crossing it, and finally going through Blue Lake and Corbell. And uh, once uh, they completed that rail line, um, the supply, main supplier to the mines, which was uh, Brizard and Company, could actually ship goods uh, not just to the Jacoby Storehouse on Arcata Plaza, but all the way to their branch store in Blue Lake. And we'll look at that a little more closely. First of all, Here's an image of the wharf when it was in action. Uh, back in the fairly early days, 1883, you can see we have sailing ships there. And the Alta was a ferry that went uh, across the bay from Eureka to Arcata, bringing uh, passengers both ways. Uh, there really was a great difficulty in people uh, going by land between those two communities. They did establish old Arcata Road, but uh, part of the year uh, it was uh, not easily traversable. It was very muddy. Uh, wagons had trouble going there. Uh, so uh, a default setting was sort of to use the Alta for people to have a quicker trip between the two communities. And at the right of this picture, you can see uh, the rail line uh, going out onto the wharf. And we'll look a little more closely at the wharf here in a slightly different picture. You can see it went quite a ways out in the bay. Uh, we have the ferry there again, flying the American flag. It's uh, once again, in eight, same year, 1883. So what we see are primarily and exclusively in this case, uh, sailing ships rather than uh, steamships. And then um, the uh, rail line uh, came into the bay and I was going to show you, uh, we, we're, we, I don't have full use of my program here, but uh, it went by uh, what was called the Marsh House, a big hotel on, uh, between um, uh, H and I Street. It's still there, a large gray building that belongs to Marge Adams, if you uh, know who she is. Uh, she would uh, be living uh, between the two rail lines that uh, went up from the wharf. And the rail line that went to the east is the one we see on this map. And it went across where, um, what was it, was it Isaacson Ford that was uh, on uh, H, uh, or I and uh, 8 yeah. Street, or is that yeah. Saki's? Yeah. Okay, well, it went by that uh, right through their car lot, and uh, they actually uh, repaired cars and what was the locomotive house that you see at the bottom of this image. And it was at this point where the one rail line went uh, off to the west uh, on its way to Blue Lake. And the arrow that's in the upper right corner of this uh, map is pointing to a body of water that is Butcher Slough, which is the one that comes right through the heart of the marsh area. And we'll look at that more closely in a minute. Um, here is uh, the first locomotive they had. At first, they just had a horse-drawn uh, series of carts that went up on the, the rails on the wharf and a white horse called Spanking Fury uh, pulled those cars. And they finally modernized to this tiny locomotive. I think they were afraid that anything bigger would cave in the wharf. And you can see they just have a couple of small cars behind it. Uh, so they weren't hauling huge loads. Uh, they nicknamed uh, this locomotive, which was actually Arcata and Mad River number one. They called it the coffee pot, I guess, because of the strange shape of the boiler in front. But this was as, about as big as they got when they were out on the bay. Well, the track divided once they got off the wharf and the one line uh, went, uh, like I said, out to Alliance and then all the way uh, up to the Mad River and out to Blue Lake. But there was a second uh, branch of the line that went up uh, close to H Street and ended right here. Uh, this is after the uh, uh, station had been abandoned. But if you see where the pink arrow is pointing, it says Arcata and Mad River Railroad Depot. And the purple arrow is pointing to J the Jacoby Storehouse, Bizarre and Company, Sorry. which is right next to it. So what this means is that the depot is right where the Arcata Post Office is today. 
And that's the building that you see here that was removed in order uh, for them to build the post office. And the, the part of the building looks kind of like a garage over to the left side here. Uh, you can even see where uh, the paint's been stained uh, from the smoke from the locomotives that uh, came up there. So uh, this in the very early days was the route that they would uh, bring supplies uh, to Bizarre and Company with their uh, storehouse and uh, they would actually unload the supplies here and would go to Bizarre's and the pack trains would uh, form in back of Bizarre's uh, uh, storehouse and then uh, travel from there out into the back country. Let's look at some pictures of how the Bizarre buildings uh, changed over time. Here it is in its original uh, version, just uh, one story in front with the basement and back. And uh, you can see they probably did a good business. It says wholesale liquor store. I guess that was their specialty in the early days. But remember, they're also uh, uh, carrying all the supplies for their stores in the back country. And eventually, uh, they had about a dozen different stores uh, in the mining areas. They had uh, places at uh, Willow Creek, Hoopa, Witchpeck, or Leans. Uh, over on the Klamath River at the, the town of Klamath, up in the mining town of Denny. Uh, they were uh, all over these uh, back uh, country places that mostly could only be reached by pack trains. And in fact, uh, Rizard and Company continued to use pack trains up until 1919 for their more remote locations. So, wow. uh, yeah, really uh, way up in time. Of course, uh, some of the other places were reachable by. Uh, autos and by wagons long before that, but up at Denny and the extreme uh, uh, range of their uh, chain of stores, uh, they had to wait much longer. And here they've modernized the store. It's still just uh, one story tall at the, the uh, plaza side of things, but now it looks a little fancier and our uh, Brizard is actually carrying a, a lot more than wholesale liquor. Then the store is remodeled into something that approaches what we see today. Uh, this postcard is probably from uh, between 1900 and 1910. Um, black and white photo and they hand colored it. So someone with a sense of artistry decided that the one woman was wearing a pink dress. We don't mm -hmm. know what color it was originally because uh, it was a black and white photo. And of course, um, you can see here that uh, the building's quite similar to what it is today. You don't have the entrance to what used to be a Brutzi Dam uh, uh, on the side uh, next to the post office, but uh, they, uh, in those days, were using that for a warehouse function. Well, anyway, I showed you on the map the way the, uh, the route that the train took to get to Blue Lake. And here is uh, Blue Lake when the train station was still operating right near the center of town. Uh, those of you that go out that way, of course, know that it's now the Blue Lake uh, Museum. But the trains came on the far left of this photo, uh, went right past the station. If we went uh, over to the right outside a camera range, the first building we'd come to would be the Broussard and Company store in Blue Lake. And uh, they actually, uh, well, if you look and see where the two ladies are standing with the child, they're standing right next to the railroad track. You can barely make out the, if I have my pointer available, I'd point to it, but the track is right in front of them. And just off camera to the right, the track divides. And there's a short little siding that went right up to the back of the Bizarre and Company store. And they would just uh, drop a single box car of supplies off there. And the people at Bizarre's would unload from there. And meanwhile, the uh, train would continue on uh, having uh, dropped that off and they would get to, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself because I wanna show you what they did right in town in Blue Lake. Uh, here we've gone past the station and you see Brizard's Emporium in the background. Uh, they later remodeled that and turned it 90 degrees so it faced the street here where all the mules are. So for many years, this was as far as Broussard could take supplies uh, to the back country by train. And they would drop them off here at their store and then pack them onto mules. As you see here, they're forming a train that might be going to Denny or Willow Creek or even to Hoopa. And you might notice uh, the fellow in the foreground is uh, probably from 
uh, Peru. Uh, when the Broussard family came to the West Coast, they came around uh, uh, Cape Horn and stopped in Chile and a couple of other uh, countries on the Pacific side of South America. And uh, they discovered that there were uh, packers down there packing into the Andes Mountains who were very uh, skillful at their work. And I guess they established contact in Peru because they actually sent down there to get some of these expert packers to come up and work for them up here. And you see uh, one of those uh, men right in the foreground on his mule. Well, anyway, uh, the train itself would continue past Brazard store and it would uh, wind up ending here out at Corbell, uh, which was the uh, terminus for the Arcata and Mad River Railroad, and was also the mill town for the uh, uh, Northern Redwood Lumber Company, which was owned by the Corbell brothers, who uh, actually got started with their champagne uh, winery on the Russian River in Sonoma County and decided that they needed, uh, they wanted redwood for their wine casks. And they came up to Humboldt County and uh, found very good redwood. And in fact, a lot of it available and decided that, well, we could also go into the lumber business. So they bought a huge tract of land on the North Fork and the Middle Fork of the Mad River and uh, established a, a logging uh, camps on the river and then uh, built gradually the town of Corbell where they had their mill. And that probably wound up making them more money for many years than uh, the champagne business. Uh, I had a picture of the Corbell Winery, but uh, I, since I can't advance this frame, you'll just have to visualize it uh, for yourself. Very beautiful building that's ivy covered, uh, probably covered with uh, soot right now from the fires. So that was pretty much uh, the route of the Arcata and Mad River Railroad. Uh, and uh, like I said, that was the rail line that uh, served uh, came off of the Arcata Wharf and then served uh, many of these outlying communities uh, as a supply route. Uh, now we're going to, uh, before we get to the second wharf, we're going to look at this kind of central part of the marsh where Butcher's Slough uh, runs through the area and where for many years there were several mill sites. Um, and let's see what we come to first of all. Well, we don't get the bonus slew insert, I'm afraid, because uh, it was a special uh, frame, but we can look at Butcher's slew here. Uh, it, uh, this is not the entire slew, but you can see on this 1870 map, it goes through the west side of Arcata. This map is uh, tilted, so uh, north is over to your left and east is up to the top of uh, this image. But you can get your bearings if you look at the Arcata Wharf so Butcher's Slough is the uh, slough that goes right uh, under my little sign here about Daniel's Slough. And then the pink line that I've drawn is the second major slough in that area, uh, known today, unfortunately, as Muck Daniel's Slough. It's actually Daniel's uh, Slough. The man's name was Hiram Sibbard uh, Daniels. It was named for. And if I had my full capability, I would be showing you the what was known as the Chapman House that uh, Daniels first lived in. And I would be uh, notifying you that H.S. Uh, Daniels was one of uh, a number of Humboldt County citizens who in the 1850s and early 1860s uh, had Indians indentured to them uh, under a law that was passed the first year that California was a state that allowed people to uh, take Indian children as basically indentured servants or actually more or less as slaves uh, and uh, keep them for a number of years. And that uh, law was only uh, revoked by the state legislature in 1863, a few months after Abraham Lincoln had uh, issued the Emancipation Proclamation freeing uh, the black slaves in the eastern part of the country. And so for a period of time, uh, there was another type of slavery that was still legal in the United States. And it was here on the West Coast in California. And the victims of that were the native Indians. But by uh, the middle of uh, 1863, 
that practice was finally outlawed. But by that time, there had been uh, probably well over 100 uh, young Indians who'd uh, been forced into this system of uh, being the servants of uh, uh, certain white people who, under the uh, original law of that time, were allowed to uh, control their lives. And let's see, we do have this. Um, I can't show you all the images, but here's the Chapman House up at the top of the picture. It's uh, been remodeled now and uh, refurbished and has become a bed and breakfast uh, facility across from Dan Hauser's house. And down at the bottom here, you see where uh, an Indian by the name of Bob, when he was 13 years old, was indentured to H.S. Daniels for a period of uh, 12 years. Uh, although I think uh, the law was uh, uh, removed before Bob reached his uh, majority or reached uh, the full term of his service, but uh, they could actually keep some of the Indians up to that age uh, so long as the law was in effect. Uh, we don't know the names of all the people that did that. Uh, there used to be a, a roll of uh, all of the uh, indenture or claims that were made, um, and uh, that mysteriously vanished from the Humboldt County Courthouse, and we only have ah. a partial list. Uh, ah. Ah. Yeah, uh, so uh, there have been other things, documents, incriminating documents that have gone missing from various archives, but that's one that uh, uh, we know uh, existed back in the 1920s and cannot be found any longer. Well, uh, I was going to do a series of overlays here. You'll have to bear with me because uh, I'm limited into what I can do. But the background for this is a, a, a Coast Survey map from 1894. And if uh, you look, you'll see a bunch of very dark lines uh, going horizontally um, for part of this area. And that shows the uh, marshland that existed in the 1890s. and um, uh, what I've done is overlay on that uh, the uh, map of the current Arcata Marsh. And that's what you see kind of in the foreground here. And it's uh, opaque enough that you can see a little bit of the earlier marshland behind it. But you can see that uh, about uh, two thirds of the marsh, uh, as we call it, the Arcata Marsh today, was uh, set down upon areas that had been wetlands uh, before uh, the 1890s, that uh, Humboldt Bay uh, had uh, an area that was a, oh, a mile or so uh, of wetlands between the bay proper and high ground, <clears throat> that uh, area that shows up with the uh, black horizontal lines, the very <clears throat> area. And uh, the things that look like veins on that are the various sloughs. And if you detect a faint pink line under my overlay, that's a butcher slough that went uh, right through uh, the left side of today's Ada <clears throat> Marsh and came down to the uh, butcher slough log pond. And we'll look at that more closely in a minute. You can see when they uh, built the various uh, treatment facilities, they actually uh, built those, uh, uh, several of those areas out onto the bay. Uh, the uh, Clop Lake and then the oxidation ponds that are, are going down off the map here uh, were actually uh, areas that were reclaimed, as they call it, from the bay itself. Uh, so Butcher Slough, uh, as near as I've been able to determine, was not named for anyone called Butcher, but rather because they had a slaughterhouse and a tannery uh, in that uh, area where the slough came through and uh, the, uh, the remnants from the slaughterhouse and from the tanning process were dumped into the slough. So it was an early way uh, to uh, pollute one of our waterways and it's commemorated by the name it was given. <laughs> Uh, this map that you see up there shows the Devlin Tanning Company. Uh, and if you look down at the photo, it's that huge barn-like structure uh, in the sort of right center of the picture, the biggest building there. And then down at the lower part of the photo, you see the railroad track, which is uh, the line on the map that you see curving around uh, from the upper left to the lower, or from the upper right to the lower left. And that's the Arcata and Mad River Railroad on its way out of Arcata. 
Uh, so this would be uh, one block um, south of the Arcata Co-op. Uh, uh, and if you look in the background on the extreme far right of the photo, you see a white building in the distance. That's uh, uh, later became Marino's Club, you know, the, the bar that burned down a number of years ago. OK, I'm going to move along. <coughs> Here's an aerial photo from 1949 before uh, the sewage treatment areas existed, before they'd done any of the work on the marsh as we know it today. Uh, so to give you your bearings, that arrow on the left pointing upward is pointing to Samoa Boulevard, and the uh, arrow on the right is pointing to South G Street, uh, which in those days was Highway 101. So, you know, the main transportation corridor, not just through Arcata, but through the county. And then uh, the squiggly line I've drawn would be Butcher's Slough. And you can see by uh, 1949 that they are already starting to uh, take over part of the wetland area uh, to the west of Butcher's Slough. Uh, that's one of the mills that is going in there. I should mention that in the 1890s, the wetland areas uh, from the bay inland uh, were cut off uh, by diking that was done by invest, an investment company that owned the land. And uh, they wanted to reclaim uh, everything almost from uh, North Manila all the way over to Bayside. Uh, and uh, what they did was allow those areas to dry out, to have a few years of rainfall to remove the salt from the earth. And then they were, uh, planted with forage crops for livestock, and they became uh, mostly dairy farming areas. Uh, and a barrier was created then by the diking machine uh, that allowed those areas to no longer be infiltrated by salt water. And now today with uh, climate change and sea level rise, we're dealing with the issue of those uh, dikes, uh, which are still in place, but often are in some locations in bad shape. Uh, being threatened and uh, either giving way or uh, being overtopped by king tides and uh, uh, thereby allowing flooding to occur in these areas that haven't seen it for many years. Mm -hmm. So we're going to look a little more at uh, these areas. The uh, uh, arrow on the upper right is I Street. That's the street you take to get out to the Arcata Marsh, if you want to go all the way down to the bay and to the parking lot. And the arrow in the lower left is the uh, railroad line in Northwestern Pacific. Uh, and you cross its uh, tracks as you go down on I Street. An area in between is the Arcata Plywood Company, uh, which uh, was active in 1952. <clears throat> the way you see it here. And let me just move to another image. This is just uh, six months later. They've dismantled the uh, smaller building up at the top. I'll go back and show you that again. You can see that kind of dark wooden structure uh, opposite the upper arrow. And uh, that's been removed. They've kept the log pond, but they've uh, greatly enlarged the mill. Uh, and uh, the mill pond has the logs that they're going to be taking into the mill and uh, uh, actually converting into plywood. And uh, just above the mill, just above that upper arrow is Samoa Boulevard. So by the 1950s, you had a huge boom in logging in Humboldt County and many other places uh, because of the need for housing materials after World War II. And for the first time in the county's history, uh, you had a lot of logging done in the back country where there were Douglas fir forests. And of course, they were still cutting redwood uh, timber uh, closer to the coast, but now they wanted uh, Douglas fir for uh, studs for the uh, construction of houses. You had many mills in the back country, and you had all sorts of new mills being built in Arcata and Eureka. At one time, they estimated, I've never been able to count them all, but approximately 50 mills at the north end of Arcata Bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're seeing uh, one of them here in a lumber yard over to the left. White City. To another image. Uh, now we're looking really at the, you know, the Arcata Marsh area. You can see uh, off in the upper right uh, areas that are, are wetlands. Uh, it's probably been after a storm, maybe even a, a flood. Uh, 
These are places now that have become part of the marsh proper. Uh, you can see the uh, Northwestern Pacific rail line curving then uh, uh, in the photo below the marsh and heading out to the left uh, towards Eureka. And the, uh, the stream that it's crossing uh, in the upper left corner of the photo is Butcher Slough. Mm -hmm. And uh, Butcher Slough, part of it's been diverted to form the log pond, which takes up the most of the left central part of uh, this photo uh, for the Twin Harbors Mill, which was in place there in uh, 1952. And at the upper end of the pond, uh, close to the top of the photo, you see the mill building and you see the conical burner off to the right of that. Uh, where they're burning uh, what they consider waste material. Terry, so, I, yes. I just noticed a hand up by Cindy Moyer. Okay. Cindy, you had a question? Yes, please. Um, looking at these pictures, I've realized for the first time that log ponds are not necessarily connected to streams that the logs were floated down. Why do we have log ponds? Oh, okay. Let me go back to, let me see if I can Let's go back to one of the mill pictures here. So it was a way to, to store and then easily uh, transport the logs into the mill itself. And when the first mills were started in Humboldt County, uh, all the logs had to be transported by water to the mills. There were no logging roads or logging railroads at first that could, uh, uh, you could carry redwood logs on. So uh, you had a series of mills along the Eureka waterfront. At uh, one time there were four or five of them there and trees would be cut on places like uh, Elk River or on uh, Freshwater uh, Creek and floated uh, down those uh, waterways into the bay and made up into rafts of multiple logs and then towed to one of the mill ponds. And uh, once they were in a mill pond and on the bay, they just put a boom of logs out that, uh, serve to corral the logs they wanted to cut. Then you would maneuver the logs one by one uh, up uh, to a conveyor belt that took the logs into the mill. And uh, then they would be cut into lumber in most cases. And the lumber would be brought out onto a dock uh, right next to the mill and right at the Eureka waterfront. And then uh, lumber schooners would tie up the dock and uh, take the lumber away. So that was a standard procedure for a long time for redwood lumber, but here in the 1950s, we see them still using the uh, mill ponds and uh, just about all the mills were still doing that uh, where they would uh, let the, the lumber, uh, the logs uh, uh, stay in the mill uh, pond for a period of time then move it uh, up into the mill and cut it. Uh, gradually, you know, they came with uh, other techniques so that you no longer uh, had the wa logs on water, but they would actually convey the logs from a deck, with hard surface uh, deck that you see for most of the mills in the later part of the 20th century and up to the present. If you notice for this uh, mill, which is making plywood, they've actually uh, converted some of the logs into smaller pieces, uh, cans of a smaller size that are in that upper pond on the upper right. If we go back to um, this picture, you can see uh, the logs uh, being corralled in what you know is now uh, the Butcher Slough Marsh. Uh, the mill would be down close to where uh, the Friends of the Arcata Marsh <coughs> and the, well, the center for the, the marsh is today. Um, let me give you another picture. This is before any of that was done. Uh, this is the south end of the Butcher Slough Marsh. And the first photo is from the 1970s before anything had been built there. And you can see all the piling uh, that was present there from that uh, mill building that we just saw in the previous photo. And then say about uh, 2010, I took this picture in the lower right corner that showed the piling still there that uh, uh, that mill was built on is actually built over part of the pond. Ah, we and, have a question yeah. from Jacqueline. Okay. Jacqueline? 
Hi, Cindy. This is Ken Fulgham. And uh, one of the reasons that they kept the uh, logs, especially the dug fir, in ponds, or if you go inland, you see big sprinkling systems on them, is to keep the logs from chucking and cracking and uh, keep the wood soft so they could mill it uh, more easily. That's not so much the problem with redwood, but it certainly is with dug fir. Yeah, in fact, if uh, you know where the Sierra Pacific Mill was out uh, on the far side of Mad River Slough, uh, they uh, had a you know a log deck right next to the old railroad line in back of the mill, and they would be sprinkling that uh, continuously, at least whenever I went out to the Mullel Dunes, you could see where they were watering that down. When that mill first opened in, uh, I think it was 1952, they actually put a log boom on Mad River Slough and had their logs there in the slough. And then uh, I don't know what year it was, but they transitioned to the, you know, the hard deck that they used in later years. But thanks for that information. So if you take uh, the path at the marsh and you know, circle the Butcher Slough, the uh, uh, marsh, you'll run across, I think, two or three of uh, these sections of concrete with a kind of metal cap on top of it. And uh, those were log dumps where the logging trucks could come and uh, unload their logs down uh, the uh, diagonal uh, side of the, this structure into the uh, log pond. And they look kind of strange today, but that's the explanation for them. And they were never taken out. They're just kind of uh, rusting away, but the, it'll take a long time before they deteriorate. So then um, when uh, they started doing serious work on uh, the converting or expanding the Arcata sewage treatment area and uh, making it into what we have today, they uh, brought in this dredge, Jupiter, which had uh, been up here working on Humboldt Bay since at least the late 1940s. It did a lot of work at uh, Braycut, uh, opposite resale lumber, and uh, created a part of the uh, extension out into the bay, the reclaimed areas there. It uh, worked down at King Salmon and dug the uh, channels there for the canals, and it built up an area at uh, Fields Landing where they put in a new uh, dock uh, at the northern end of town. And then uh, it uh, came up uh, very close to Butcher's Slough and uh, was uh, birthed there, just kind of at the shoreline, and then it sunk. And this is the picture we have of that. Uh, but it was still owned, and uh, the owners uh, finally realized that they could make some money by doing uh, some of the dredge work that was necessary to upgrade the Arcata sewage treatment plant. So they actually rehabilitated Jupiter, uh, got it afloat again, and uh, the dredge wound up doing the major work on the uh, Humboldt Bay side of the marsh to create uh, many of the areas we see today. And you might recall um, seeing Jupiter uh, opposite College of the Redwoods uh, for many years. It uh, wound up down there uh, by the uh, wildlife refuge at Hookton, uh, off of Hookton Slough, and did its final dredging work there. And then it was moved over to this spot on White Slough and stayed there for years until it uh, burned. Um, down at the bottom in the black and white photo, there's Jupiter uh, opposite uh, Resale Lumber Company uh, building out uh, into the bay in uh, 1947. So poor Jupiter, who uh, had done all of this heroic work, was just left for years to languish. And then one night, it burned and uh, to the water line. And so now we just have an empty spot where it existed previously. So now we're going to finish up the program by looking at that second wharf. We're moving over a little farther east now. It was called the Shingle Wharf. It uh, was built by uh, what became the, the Bayside Lumber Company. It was earlier the Flanagan and Brosnan uh, Lumber Company. And uh, they uh, actually cut extensively up in Jacoby Creek. They did not have a mill anywhere near Bayside. Uh, it was called the Bayside Mill uh, because it was on Humboldt Bay down near the foot of Del Norte Street, actually in back of where Costco is today. 
And so all of the lumber or logs that were cut up on Jacoby Creek, where they owned the, the woodlands, were actually floated out into the bay and taken down to the west side of Eureka. And because that was on the bay, uh, side of the bay, they called it Bayside. And then the community of Bayside, which really isn't on the bay itself, but where the rail line went through, uh, took the name from that. So let's look at that line. Uh, here we are uh, looking at uh, Humboldt Bay North or Arcata Bay. And the red line I've put on this map is showing the second railroad now the Bayside Mill and Lumber Company Railroad, or uh, earlier was Flanagan and Brosnan. And you can see how uh, it sticks out. It went out on the wharf uh, into the bay. And if it had kept going in a particular direction, it would have bumped into the Arcata Wharf. And instead of doing that, they angled it a little farther south into a different channel. And uh, a different group of uh, ships would anchor there to take off various supplies. There was a shingle mill uh, owned by Harpston Spring in the Sunny Bray area, and I believe a second shingle mill in the Bayside area. And the shingles that were cut at those mills were brought out on this wharf for transportation. And uh, because of that, they called it the shingle wharf. Um, you can see where the down in the lower right uh, corner of this map, uh, the rail line ended way up in the Jacoby Creek uh, Canyon. Uh, it wasn't just to gain access to lumber, but also to the two, excuse me, two quarries that they had in uh, Jacoby Creek. Mm -hmm. uh, those quarries were actually providing rock uh, to be used on uh, the jetties in uh, at, near the mouth of Humboldt Bay, and we'll mention them in, in a minute. Uh, the destruction up there was extensive. Here's a photo taken uh, based on a lawsuit from uh, the early 1900s when uh, the dike uh, at, uh, that uh, diked in part of Jacoby Creek overflowed and uh, damaged some ranch land. And the uh, reason why it overflowed was there was so much debris coming down Jacoby Creek. And you can see where it's piled up here in the upper creek. Uh, the cause of the problem in the higher reaches of the creek was the logging. And this is an area that's been logged and they just left some of the debris in the creek. And you can see it's pretty much of a clear cut up above that. You can see uh, how um, material has been washed into the creek and part of the material is actually washing downstream the aggregate and uh, it's causing a rise in the level of Jacoby Creek and making flooding in the lower part of the creek uh, much uh, more frequent. Then added to that, you had the quarries operating up there where they dug very far into the mountainside, uh, in this case on the south side of Jacoby Creek. You can see how they've uh, dug away here. Um, here is the quarry crew. So it was a big operation. You can see 50, 60 uh, workers out there uh, taking the rock away. And uh, they had uh, the, uh, special train cars that would uh, haul the rock down to the wharf. And we'll look at those train cars in a minute. Uh, the train came down. Um, the bottom photo here, you see the tracks that are crossing Old Arcata Road. This is uh, just south of uh, the Bayside Post Office, just where Old Arcata Road makes the turn to the south. In fact, you can see the church, which is still standing uh, on uh, Old Arcata Road there in the background where I've, I've got my pointer activated. Uh, you can see it back there. Uh, then the building next to the automobile was the Bayside store. And so that other photo here from a different angle shows the store. So the rail line came down uh, uh, directly in back of the Bayside Grange and then crossed uh, Old Arcata Road here. Uh, then a uh, curve to the north to go closer to Sunny Bray and eventually out onto the wharf. And here is the Harps and Spring Shingle Mill in the Sunny Bray area with their own little siding uh, where they could uh, bring the shingles down to the main rail line. You can see the shingles uh, cut and stacked there. And uh, there, it was double tracked to go out uh, uh, through the Gannon Slough and uh, Bayside area. 
You can see the engine on the right here has uh, all of these shingles uh, coming from the shingle mill. And the uh, train over on the left, I think it's, uh, it's hard to, to see exactly, but it looks like an uncut log that they're going to dump into the uh, bay and float down to the bayside mill. So you've got a rail line going all the way up into Kobe Creek and coming out into the wharf. And where was the wharf? Well, let's look at this picture. Um, if you go out to the South Oxidation Pond, uh, that's the southern and southeasternmost pond at the Arcata Marsh, you can walk around the, the, the marsh uh, on an access road. And if you're over on the east side of that road and look down towards the bay, you'll see a series of these posts. I've got a purple arrow pointing to one of them. And the close-up, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, shows you what those posts are. They were piling for the shingle wharf. So that southeast side of the oxidation pond is actually built upon the remnants of the second wharf. And you don't see any of the wharf anymore. You just see a few of the piling. But that gives you an idea of where it was. If you look above that arrow in the background, you're looking over towards the Sunny Bray area. And the rail line would have curved around that uh, part of the bay that you see in the photo and then headed towards Jacoby Creek. So there's a lot of photos uh, that claim to be of the Arcata Wharf. And this is one of them taken by uh, Erickson around 1900. In fact, almost all the photos I found uh, that claim to be the Arcata Wharf are not. They are of the Shingle Wharf. And there's uh, three ways we can tell that this is not the Arcata Wharf. If you look at this picture closely, I hope you can see it well on your screen. But if we start over on the uh, far left, you can see uh, these stacks of material. Well, those are all shingles. Uh, and you know, that's why it was called the Shingle Wharf. And uh, there's uh, perhaps a mile worth of wharf there where they could store these shingles and then load them onto uh, these, in this case, sailing ships. And then if you go over to the far right of this photo, uh, you can see the bay in the lower part of the photo and the sky in the upper part. In between, you see a dark band, and that is the hills above uh, Bayside and Sunny Bray. And if you're looking at the Arcata Wharf, you would not see uh, mountains directly in back of the wharf like you do for this one. And then the real giveaway is the, uh, the barge that I've uh, circled in the lower center of the photo. On that barge are 21 small rail cars in uh, three rows of seven each. And those are cars carrying the crushed or broken rock from the Jacoby Creek Quarry. And they are going to be hauled from the shingle wharf here uh, down Humboldt Bay. And in fact, I'll show you where they wound up. This is the loading apron at the South Jetty. So if you went down uh, to the south end of Humboldt Bay and went out to Table Bluff and then came back along the South Spit and drove all the way uh, to the end of the road on the South Spit, so you're right up near the bay entrance. And if you got out of your car and walked 100 yards or so to the east towards the bay, you'd come to the site of this loading apron that they had when they were first constructing the jetty. And you can see they've got uh, three sets of tracks coming from the uh, apron. And uh, they narrow down to a single track. They had a dedicated locomotive that was out here that hauled these small cars, which are on the barge here that I've uh, circled. And uh, they would haul those out onto the jetty as they were building it and then dump uh, the loads of the rock uh, off to the side and gradually form more of the jetty as they moved westward. And so we're at a point here where they're about ready to maneuver that barge uh, to the end of the loading apron. And remember I said there were three rows of seven cars each. Well, for each of those three rows, you've got one set of tracks. So they would match up, the barge would nose its way in to the loading apron and the tracks would match up with the tracks on the barge and they just haul a row of seven cars off the barge at a time and then bring it uh, onto the uh, growing jetty as they went farther to the west. And uh, so 
uh, if I'd been totally mobile in this presentation, I would at this point have the big purple arrow or the pink arrow come down and point to the, the uh, part of the uh, loading apron. And I would ask you what that is. And if any of you had the correct answer, uh, it would be right there before you. It's the end and it's the end of the loading apron and it's also the end of the program. So that's <laughs> it. Thank you. And uh, if you have questions, we'll, we'll deal with them now. Okay, uh, I have one. Okay. When you were talking about the Brizard outfit and hauling stuff around, you mentioned liquor. Yeah. It made me think that water quality might not have been good in the area. I understood <laughs> that 100 and 150 years ago, the, the water was bad in many places in the United States and alcohol became the drink of choice. How much of that was true here? Well, that's a good question, you know, and I think at first uh, oh. when uh, they went out in the mining areas, uh, they had pretty pure sources of water, but the mining greatly disrupted uh, some of that. And once you had a congregation of people out there with poor sanitation practices, I think you did uh, suffer some pollution in the mining areas. Uh, I think probably the overriding reason why uh, uh, liquor was so popular out there, though, is these guys simply like to get drunk. And uh, you time and again, I uh, read reports of uh, these uh, pack trains going out into the mine, uh, mining country up in Crescent City. They had a train of 32 mules that went to the, the mines up in Del Norte County. And in this one report, uh, when they got to their destination and all the people were waiting to see what came, there was one mule that was carrying sugar, and there were 31 mules that was carrying whiskey. <laughs> and uh, that was their highest priority. And, but you're right, of course, you know, they, if they, even if they had beer, for example, and, you know, in many places, uh, they would actually water down beer in, uh, in, say, Europe, for example, where they would have uh, small beers, they called it, and have about 2% alcohol. And so workers who might be in an area where there was contaminated water could have a couple of beers at lunch, but they were so low alcohol qu uh, quantity, they wouldn't get drunk, but it would uh, be a safer, purer form of liquid than if they were drinking the water. So it, it's hard for me to say exactly, uh, you know, how, uh, how much of that thought went into the people's liking for the liquor, but Time and again, you'll read of these bar fights out in the back country. Uh, seldom were people shot. It seemed like uh, the preferred weapon was to uh, use a knife, and they would have knife fights in the bar many times, and they could often be fatal, just like uh, the uh, gunshots were. In fact, uh, that house that we looked at, the uh, oh. Daniels house that later became the Chapman house, uh, that was uh, uh, John Chapman, the man that... Uh, lived in Daniel's house at a later point in time, was actually arrested for murder out at Orleans uh, when he shot, um, I believe it was his uncle. And uh, he was tried out there, I think, in the town, but uh, he was found now guilty by reason of self-defense. And it was another one of these bar fights where uh, it would be so violent that uh, someone would wound up being killed. Wow. So yeah. it wasn't the good old days. Yeah, the good old days, yeah. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Roberta. Okay, hi, Roberta. Uh, uh, how, on both of the wharves and stuff, how much did the tides influence how they could effectively use the uh, uh, wharves? You know, that's a good question, and I, I'm not exactly sure. If um, I hadn't drawn those lines on top of that, uh, not, uh, the chart of uh, hum, uh, Northern Humboldt Bay, we would see the depths of the channel. And uh, especially for the channel to the Arcata Wharf, you had depths of uh, 15 or 20 feet. And I think that's based on the mean tide level. Uh, so there would be times at low tide where uh, uh, there might be stretches of that uh, near the wharf where maybe they weren't able to uh, get in and out. but. Uh, that channel especially was quite deep, 
And as it ran down uh, towards the mouth of Humboldt Bay, the channel came very close to the Eureka waterfront. And in there was at a depth of uh, 15 feet or more, just naturally. And that's one reason why Eureka was able to develop so quickly because all they had to do was build a small wharf out to that channel. And it didn't have to be this one long, you know, mile and a half long wharf that Arcata had to do. So it was a great advantage uh, for Eureka to have that deep water channel there. Now with the uh, shingle wharf, uh, the depth of that was not as great and they might've had more problems there. But as you saw from those photos, they still had fairly uh, deep draft ships there carrying the shingles out. Uh, on the other hand, you see from this last picture, they had a barge, you know, which didn't draw much water at all. In fact, they were using uh, one of the ferry boats uh, to haul the barge, and that was a shallow draft ship also. So I can't an answer your question exactly. Well, I know that the uh, north end of the bay, because of a lot of the, what you saw in Jacoby Creek and all that sort of stuff, uh, the channels, are not as deep anymore. So when did those take effect and were the filling in of the channels part of the reason the wharves are gone? Yeah. Well, the filling, uh, filling in the channels started really early. When I showed you those pictures of Upper Jacoby Creek, you could see the devastation in the canyon there that was happening in the 1880s and 1890s. And uh, so all of uh, the debris from the logging and uh, earth and small rock from the hillsides were suddenly exposed. Uh, it was coming down that channel and filled in on Jacoby Creek. They had a similar problem over at Freshwater. And the one that's best documented is down at Elk River, uh, you know, partway down the south side of the bay. And uh, they logged uh, fairly far up Elk River in the very early days in the 1870s, 1880s. And what they did there was in the summertime when they were logging, they would haul the logs over to Elk River and put the logs in the river, which had almost no water in it at the time because it was summer. And uh, they would just pile up masses of logs there and build a small splash dam behind the pile of logs and wait until the heavy rains came. And when they had a really heavy rain, they would knock that splash dam away and the water would come coursing down and actually move these full-size logs down the channel of Elk River and out into the bay. And one of the ranchers down there complained that uh, in five years of his living next to Elk River, he had seen the elevation of Elk River, the, the, the bottom of the river, rise nine feet because of the logging practices. And it got so bad that the mouth of Elk River finally was shut off because of all the alluvium that was coming down that formed a big sandbar at the mouth of the river. And for a while, they couldn't even get their logs into the bay. So there was a tremendous effect happening even in the late 19th century. And you know, that continued in later times. And of course, where you've had heavy logging come back again, like on Elk River when Pacific Lumber Company was logging there uh, you, you've had the continuing problems, uh, places like uh, where the covered bridges are and the access roads to those houses on the far side of the covered bridges are now flooding uh, to the point where sometimes the residents are stranded and can't get out. Wow. Uh, it looks like there's a question here from, uh, it's labeled Jacqueline, but I think I heard a man's voice connected to that. Are you there? Yeah, this is Ken Fulgham again. We're both watching it. Excellent presentation, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, I've been living here since 1963 when I moved over from Reading to go to Humboldt. And I came back as a professor for 38 years. And I used to teach a course called Natural Resource Conservation for about a decade. And uh, go to the slide in the upper Jacoby Creek that shows the forest in the background behind the, yeah. uh, you can find that one. Let's see, uh, this one or the next one? Uh, no, uh, next one. Okay, next one. that one? There you go. So okay. I would show slides like that that I had gathered from some of my friends like Jim Timmons and some of the early ranchers that yeah. showed the devastation of the logging back in the 1800s. And it teaches the students 
that they worry about the logging practices today with the degree of regulations that we have in California, nothing compared to what you see back there and the debris coming down that channel that went right out into the bay, mud, uh, rocks, and wood debris. Uh, it was very interesting. And, um, you know, it's just, it was fascinating for them to almost be exposed to that because they'd never seen pictures like what you have here or what I had to show them. Thank you. Yeah, and it's a remarkable. You know, we do have some documentation with photos like this that go back 100 years or so. And uh, like in this particular photo here, um, there was a, uh, after the Bayside uh, Mill and Lumber Company was done with their logging, they had a bunch of debris. And in fact, you can still see uh, some log fragments and, uh, at the side of the creek. And it was just kind of a, a pile of junk wood mostly. And they let it alone, but a fellow uh, came in and bought the right from them to remove uh, some of the debris because uh, he could actually still uh, cut some of it into shingles. And when he started removing some of these smaller logs, uh, it actually caused the kind of clot there that was almost like a small log jam to break loose. And then you had this uh, flood incident that came down and actually uh, breached the dikes in the lower Jacoby Creek. Hmm. Wow. Speeded up erosion here. Yeah. All right. Uh, other questions, folks? Okay. Well, I think we've done it. Jerry, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. I'm going to think of some of these pictures when I walk around the marsh with my dog. Okay. Yeah. It was my pleasure. And uh, thank you all for taking part. Uh, you know, this is the closest we can come to a, a real live presentation right now. And uh, it certainly is uh, better than not having anything. And I'm glad we've got Zoom available as a stand in here. We may even work the bugs out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When we do this. <laughs> thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. So thank you once again. And thank you all for coming. We're going to have another talk next month. And the speaker is Mark uh, Wilson, who will talk about the bacteria that we uh, find it easy to ignore and their role that they play in the marsh. So thank you all once again. And I'm going to sign off the program and take back the host. Thank you again. Great. Great. Thanks, Elliot. Okie doke. So good night, everyone.